And the same thing that happens when they start playing with computer models and building buildings. They take on risk, get a big profit, walk away, and leave the disaster behind for the rest of us. And so we have what we can call the Titanic Syndrome. I'm a, I'm a member of the Titanic Historical Society. It's still my favorite disaster. Um, and I, I told you I did my, my undergraduate work on U-boats, so you know, sinking ships and everything. So what was very interesting uh, about the Titanic was I had actually studied it in detail, um, and I knew about the cutters, I knew about Wilding, and all the, uh, the engineers, and now and all the argument about whether it broke in half or not. And all of the experts in both of the American and British tribunals, and all their experts concurred, the people who said it broke in half were nitwits who didn't understand real engineering. They were these silly women and low-grade crewmen. A ship breaking in half, impossible. While they testified, it was impossible for the ship to have broken in half. But just like it's unsuitable, right? Impossible. Of course, when, when uh, Ballard went down and found it broken in half, just like the witnesses had said it did. The witnesses were right, and the engineers were wrong, and the whole profession was wrong. But the insistence, I mentioned this because I mentioned it earlier, the insistence that the ship did not break in half kept the metallurgist of the time from asking the question, why the ship break in half? And if they'd taken the steel that they were making, chilled it down to the temperature, and hit it with a hammer, they would have found out why. It didn't take anything magical. <clears throat> it just took understanding <clears throat> that steel on land and steel in freezing water is not in the same situation. All right? It's like when the Normandy burned, we learned about, you know, putting water on ships. <clears throat> so, the lack of any kind of system that since the time of the Titanic has been known that the alliance on inadequate regulation control innovation can produce a disaster. There's no systematic response generated analyzing the relationship among designers, test developers, and regulators. Right. And the only, only faculty member, as far as I know, in the School of Engineering in the United States who's a specialist in regulation. Yeah. So we have what is called the Titanic Syndrome. And this involves the titanic defense and the titanic response. The titanic defense. After every disaster, all of the responsible parties claim, we comply with all government regulations. All right? Now, some of these responsible parties are charlatans. They knew all along the regulations were inadequate for the hazard. This is true in the titanic, for sure. Others are often genuinely surprised, and this is my blood, when the regulations don't generate safety because they don't know because the engineers didn't tell them that you're regulating the wrong thing. <clears throat> the Titanic response, I, I took the picture, I don't know why, uh, is to do as little as possible and address only the precise failure, not the root cause. Which is the normal thing, and I have a picture of the double bottom being put on the Titanic instead of dealing with the steel. And the Olympic, the sister ship. Um, Normally, the re Titanic response is you put a patch on that problem. Put a sprinkler right there where the fire was and we'll be, we'll be all done. Um, and the minimalist response, and I've criticized the um, NIST report for a minimalist response to the high-rise building problem. Now, these are always buoyed by comfortable assumptions. <coughs> and the critical comfortable assumption <coughs> is that legal compliance is sufficient for technical safety. And these assumptions are often made without the slightest analysis of the regulatory system. <clears throat> so we have created a structure or model for how regulatory tests actually get developed out in the real world and try to figure out a way by inputting into the process to improve it. Um, and uh, it's a four-step process that we believe actually occurs uh, in operations that think of themselves as doing the right thing. The first step is defining the technological frame for regulation. This is a concept from Biker in um, uh, Meister. It's a, he's a Dutchman. Um, the technological frame describes the problem that people think they're dealing with in creating regulation. High-rise building fires are a technological frame. All right. So you, this is what you actually. This is the problem with the bicycle. Do we all have the same frame? Are we all talking about the same problem? And the scope of the frame is critical. For example, when I first taught in 1975, Fire Safety Codes and Standards for John Bryan, the first thing I wrote on the blackboard was that arson is a design criteria in modern buildings. And I have to tell you, both the SFPE and the NFPA were hysterical about that. They did not think that arson was their problem. I guess, why? Now it is. 
All right? Frames are described in natural language, people with different backgrounds. We find enormous differences when people talk about the problem when they try to describe the frame. The second step is creating the technological model. And a regulatory technological model is a derivation based on one or more frames. You can actually have multiple frames overlapping. And this defines the specific scientific and engineering data, principles, and assumptions which are thought to be relevant to controlling the technology. In other words, this is where you start trying to scientificate the problem. You reduce the frame to a technological model. Now, at Mont Blanc, for example, they made a mistake because their model was wrong as to what the problem was. All right? And, and this, is, this is a question. Do you have the right model? The technological model of the SBIs, insofar as it's been documented at all, if I can read it, um, is an attempt to replicate the room corner test, which means that it is unique. It's, it's the model of a model. In other, words, they, they, in other words, it was considered valid because it agreed with this other model. There was no attempt at all that I could try to figure out what it meant in reality. Uh, and now, if they have secret records that I didn't see, that's different. Maybe it does. Oh, yes, like. So, including or excluding a characteristic in a model for regulation is a process of concurrence by interested party rather than rigorous analysis. This is the fundamental problem of model building and regulatory process, which is it is not done in any kind of rigorous analytical way. All right, it's done by a bunch of people sitting around a table. All of them bring their particular vested interests to the table, and it's a concurrence model by vested interests. So things which are either expensive to find out, ugly little things around here, the things that are a problem over there, they tend to get excluded from the model by a process. And since the models are rarely published and preserved, it's difficult to analyze the thought process. We've gone back and tried to do it retrospectively in a couple areas outside of fire, but then we find the same problem. This is where people talk about uh, I, I'll give an example. I was, I was involved in fire safety issues in a pathology laboratory in a hospital. And absolutely nobody included in the model of the fire problem of the pathology laboratory the injuries of the patients who spent the destruction of their specimens would require new biopsies. All right? In other words, they figured if they got the staff out of the thing and they were just burning up specimens, they weren't hurting people. But you have to reoperate on people to get new specimens. It just wasn't part of the model. I find this absolutely regular. For example, uh, the, my, my big fight with the carboxyhemoglobin hypothesis, and David and I have had some very interesting fun times with this, is it doesn't deal at all with brain injuries. You cannot assume that a person exposed to less than lethal levels of carbon monoxide won't be brain damaged by it. You can walk out of a building and suffer brain damage for years afterwards from carbon monoxide. We know that. But it's not in the model. All the tenability models. Who else uses tenability the way the fire service does? Well, that's a separate area. But the question of what's in the model. Then from the model, they abstract a handful of variables for a test method. And this is where it gets even crazier at times. And this is the, the floor of the, uh, the pill test for carbon in the United States. It's easy to show that when they abstract it from the test method to the, to, from the model to the test method, they made egregious errors of, of excluding things because they complicated the process of actually building a test. And the problem is only a very small set of the subset of the real world variables are actually used in the test. And the reason is, at this stage, the uh, regulatory, the forensic concerns, the issue of, well, you're going to treat my product unfairly, or this test isn't adequately re replicable, or the forensic, the regulatory concerns dominate the process. This is where they start worrying about round robins. Only after they've done a ludicrous abstraction from the model. They, and, and, and every time you see when they do a round robin, they tighten up and narrow down and have fewer variables in the test. Because it's those variables that produce all the, the deviation. So regulatory tests are designed to give clear-cut discrete outputs, even if the underlying reality is not a continuum, but a matrix. 